to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. We're glad you're joining us as we continue the conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, today's topic is around health, and we've got some really great panelists for you today. Um, but before we get started, I do want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the groups hosting this event. Um, Women United and Emerging Leaders are engagement groups at United Way of Greater Chattanooga. Uh, comprised of thought leaders in the community, these groups hold events, network, and volunteer throughout the year, providing multiple ways to engage with the community and support impact. Uh, Women United is comprised of a community of individuals committed to be building comprehensive support systems necessary for families to thrive, while Emerging Leaders hosts a community of young professionals 40 and under, who are committed to improving the future of Greater Chattanooga for all. The best part, there's no minimum donation required to join these groups. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have more questions about getting involved with these groups. We have openings coming up soon for our leadership committees, and we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to join. Um, I would also like to take a brief moment and uh, to introduce everyone to our newest staff member. Some of you may have met Natalie Patrick, uh, she just joined us in August and she will be soon overseeing both Women United and Emerging Leaders. So you'll get to meet her briefly at the end of the program, but I did wanna go ahead and let you all know that she is with us and she is so excited about the work that she's gonna be able to do with these engagement groups. Um, so now I'd like to go ahead and get us started with the program. We're so excited to bring you today's conversation around equity, diversity, inclusion, and health. Um, we've got some really great speakers who are working in this field every single day. So um, I'm not going to introduce them with their titles just yet because they're going to do that at the beginning of this conversation. But please welcome Ladarius Price, Dr. Martina Harris, Elizabeth Affling, and our moderator, Nicole Brown. Now I will hand it over to Nicole to go ahead and get us started. And I'm going to hop off the screen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. We're so pleased that you're joining us and we're grateful for United Way, Women United and Emerging Leaders for inviting us to have this conversation uh, regarding equity, diversity, inclusion, and health. As I think all of us would agree, health is probably the most important uh, topic that we need to moving forward to have a conversation every day, every waking moment that you have, talk about your health as it relates to equity, diversity, and inclusion. I'm so excited to be able to have this conversation with this very talented uh, group of panelists because uh, they're very passionate with the community here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they know their topic very, very well. Like this is a scholar version of what you're getting for this series. So at this time, I'd like to say hello again. My name is Nicole Brown. I'm the manager of community benefits and diversity here at CHI Memorial. And it's a beautiful day in the city to also say hello and welcome to our panelists. And we will go kind of uh, one by one. I want to give him a wave and unmute his microphone. We have with us today, Ladarius Price. He is the community outreach director at Sempa Community Care. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. And we'll ask you a few more questions, just a few moments. I also would like to say hello to the one and only uh, and she's been very passionate in her career for a long, long time. Want to say hello to uh, Dr. Martina Harris. She is the Assistant Dean of Nursing and Allied Health and Program Director at Chattanooga State Community College. Hello and welcome to you, Dr. Harris. And we cannot have this panel without having the one and only Elizabeth Apley. You guys know Elizabeth, she is the Chief Diversity Officer at the Erlanger Health System. So if you all could all unmute your mics and we can start this conversation. And thank you again to the participants joining us today. Please note that we want you to be a part of this conversation. So if you would like to ask your questions via a video, we can add you to this conversation via video. If you like to watch and just submit your questions and feedback uh, during this conversation, you can also do that in the chat. So let's get started uh, by also just getting one thing stated. We have been through a tremendous pandemic, part one, part two, part three, you name it. And I think it has awakened a lot of people, uh, not just here in our city, in our state, in our country, around the world. We now have your attention. And so I wanna start off with Elizabeth by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Erlanger. And, and, and as a part two, you know, we have part two questions all the time in, in conversations. As a part two, if you could, Elizabeth, 
Tell mm -hmm. us uh, what kind of uh, methods you use to ensure that our Langer sustains a respectful and inclusive culture for your staff. All right, good morning. Well, good afternoon, actually. And um, thank you for having me today and being a part of this uh, great panel and an opportunity to participate in the Emerging Leaders panel today. I am, as you know, a lot of you already know, I've been employed with Erlanger for 20 plus years. I've uh, previously held positions in the Human Resources Department as employee relations representative and all around girl in HR. I currently serve as the uh, Chief Diversity Officer in uh, Erlanger Health System. And as the uh, Chief, the CDO, I provide uh, leadership oversight um, in efforts to create sustainable and the respectful inclusive culture at Erlanger. So you asked what kind of methods do we use to ensure that our employees are respectful and, and inclusive? Uh, well, we have a lot of things that we've put in process and in place. And you all know that people do their best work when they feel a sense of belonging at work. And inclusion is a sense of belonging. So employees wanna feel respected, they wanna feel valued, they wanna know that they are at, uh, being supported and they have that supportive energy and a commitment uh, from our executive team and from our managers and uh, people that are in charge of them. So some of, the things, some of the diversity initiatives that we have in place that we've been doing for years and we always celebrate our cultural holidays. And we, uh, we have people, uh, employees of different cultures within that organization, within our organization. So we like to have them share some of their ideas and some of the things that they would like to see celebrated during that time. We have ongoing uh, training, our diversity and inclusion training, our cultural sensitivity training, sexual orientation and gender identity training, language services is very important. We uh, develop a program for our language services program to make sure that we are providing reasonable accommodations for our limited English proficient patients that, are, that um, come to our facility. A well, and a well being is important to us too. So since COVID, our executives have noticed that a lot of employees are doing very well working at home. And I know some of you are doing the same things in your organization. So we are encouraging our employees, if you can work and be flexible at home, then we, you're doing your best work. And it has been noted that they are. Working from home is a great component now. So we're encouraging our employees to take time off, you know, work from home. Um, even the holidays are coming up. So during the holidays, we want you to be proactive. We want you to stay at home with your families if you can. And um, we're encouraging that uh, well-balanced, work-home balance. And also one of the, the huge things that's um, about to happen in our organization that I'm very proud of right now uh, is our hospitals developing a diversity council. It's because, because we believe that diversity work should be shared, a shared responsibility. It's not just on the CDO. Because most of you know, CDO's work is very hard, is very stressful, and it's a strategic work. And so we like for our employees to be involved in that work. So we're developing that um, diversity council so we can track, track and measure diversity within the organization. And we can focus on uh, ways to do better. Because we know that even with uh, our recruiting efforts, we can do better with our recruiting efforts also. And we know that recruiting is pretty hard right now because of COVID. So diversity is having a seat at that table. We know that inclusion is having that voice and belonging is a voice. It's having that voice to be heard. So we feel like the diversity council is gonna be a great tool and asset for us moving forward. Elizabeth, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you're doing over at the Erlanga Health System. And now I have the honor of introducing a very uh, strong, passionate community advocate. You've seen him all over the place, all over Chattanooga, Tennessee. I want LeJarius Price to tell him a little bit about himself and uh, STEM for Community Care. And your two part is that I just want you to know that we all applaud you for the role that Simple played during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but your my question, your two part question is, how have you all shifted to meet the needs of the community, LeJarius? All right, thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited. Uh, I'm excited every day, so there's nothing new. Um, and so I'm Ladarius Price. I'm the 
community outreach director at Simple Community Care. Uh, in January of 2022, I will have been there four years now. Um, and it's been very, very fulfilling for me um, to be in that role. It's a role I was just telling a dear friend of mine earlier this morning during a conversation that being that simple, one of the greatest things is they have not put me in a box and they pretty much allowed me to create the role um, that so many people in my community see me play uh, as a part of being a part of that team. And so I'm very, very grateful. Uh, Simpler is we've been known for many years. It used to be formerly Chattanooga Cares. Um, and after I was there for about four months, we rebranded and became Simpler. And we did that first and foremost for our clients because we wanted to remove the stigma that was around Chattanooga Cares that all we were were HIV and STI clinic. Um, and even though that's our wheelhouse, infectious disease, um, through our rebranding and, and has, as, as we've progressed throughout time, you know, we've become so much more um, than just an infectious disease organization. Um, and now, of course, we do primary care. Um, to answer your, the second part of your question, Nicole, you know, it's been a blessing. I know that Simple has been a blessing to, to our community during the time of this pandemic, because even though we're in infectious disease, a lot of the dollars that were earmarked to, you know, HIV, sexually transmitted infection, education and things of that nature, we shifted some of that money to answer the call of our community as it relates to COVID testing and COVID vaccines and education and things of that nature. So um, it's been a shift, uh, but, I'm, you know, I'm thinking back to the very beginning of this, uh, you know, we went into the Alton Park community where the Bethlehem Center is. And we were one of the first organizations to take COVID testing directly to the community. And that's what we've been very, very blessed and fortunate at is that we take our resources and we take it right to the front doorstep of the community. It's one thing to say, well, we made those resources available. It's something totally different when you meet people where they are. Um, and that's the thing when I talk about the creativity and thinking outside of the box, uh, not checking the box and being boxed in, that's what we've been uh, very successful at throughout this pandemic. And so even with that, you know, they've allowed me to step outside of even what I do for them. And a lot of my time has been spent when you think about Get Vaccinated Chattanooga and doing a lot of the vaccines in underserved communities. Uh, we've been very, very fortunate to do those things as well. Um, and so it, it's just, it's been a great ride. You know, I attribute a lot of what I do in healthcare to my late friend and mentor, uh, Chris Ramsey, who taught me so much before he transitioned out of the earth uh, about healthcare. And I was telling a group of young men on this past Sunday, you know, God will place people in your life to accelerate you through, you don't have to learn and figure out everything on your own. And so he gave me a Chris Ramsey to teach me so many of those things. So uh, I'm just fortunate and honored um, to serve my community. I'm a servant. I don't do a lot around introductions. I don't care about all of that. I'm just a servant. When I leave this earth one day, I just want people to know uh, that I cared about my community. I gave my community everything uh, that I had. I want to die empty. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful to be here today. Thank you so much for that response, Ladarius, and also the tribute to uh, Chris Ramsey, as all of us were uh, close friends with him. Um, before we get to it, we got to get started. I want to make sure that we pause and, and allow Dr. Martina Harris to talk about her role. I can brag about her because she is a very close friend. But talk about her role at Chattanooga State. Uh, I want to brag about the fact that you've been appointed uh, by the governor to the Tennessee Board of Nursing. And I have a two-part question for you because you are the scholar, you're the academic here. And I wanna ask you two things. How does, uh, oh, and by the way, tell us about your responsibility to Chattanooga State too with this uh, nursing appointment with the governor. But how does equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, have a role in this space? So Dr. Harris, we're looking forward to hearing from you and then we'll get into the conversation. Good morning or good afternoon. And again, I too am honored to be a part of this panel. Uh, as Nicole says, we are dear friends, and so she knows that I am not one to really brag on myself, so I'm going to be 
very quick to say, I serve, as Ladaria says, I have the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Dean of Nursing and Allied Health at Chattanooga State Community College and also the Nursing Program Director. Uh, I have been here since 2013 and have loved every minute of it. And the part that I love about being a part of the community college is that we have a leader, our president, she encourages and she supports the fact that I want to be a part of the community. So she is always uh, encouraging, allowing if we come to her with ideas. And so I'll say, and Ladarius will echo this, is that we were very involved with Get Vaccinated Chattanooga because of the latitude that I am given by administration to be a part of the community. And so for that, I am forever grateful because too, I am a native of Chattanooga and my heart is the community. And again, my faculty, my students, we always take part in the community. As you said earlier, is that diversity, equity, and inclusion. Chattanooga State, we take that serious. And so we now have a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, vice president. And so he, we work very closely with Quincy on some of the ideas and initiatives that we want to do to, to reflect that our nursing program and our student body is reflective of the community that we serve. So we have a long way to go, but again, we are working toward a goal that everyone, as someone said, has a sense of belonging. So you want to come to class, you want to come to campus and feel like this is where you were supposed to be. So we want Chattanooga State to be the college that they select based on what we have to offer. Now the part B, my role as the uh, appoint, being appointed by Governor Lee to the Tennessee Board of Nursing truly again is an honor, but we have the opportunity as members of that board to ensure that health and safety is our number one reason for service. And so when we meet, as we will meet this coming Thursday and Friday, we review a lot of uh, laws, a lot of things, that take place, but the biggest thing is that being in that role, I'm able to look at opportunities that uh, will expand and, and, and be able to um, have presence, presence from an RN perspective, from an African-American perspective, so that if there are opportunities for laws to be discussed, I'm at the table. So uh, again, this is my only my second meeting, so I'm still learning. So hopefully next year I'll be invited back to the Women's United and Emerging Leaders and I can give you more information. Thank you so much for that update. Looking at the time and saying good afternoon to everyone again. We're about 12.18 on, on this uh, Tuesday. So we want to get started into this conversation. But uh, before I ask the panelists uh, the question, I want to give you some reference as the audience. Uh, when you think about the 2019 picture of health uh, from Hamilton County, and when you think about African-Americans in this particular report, um, here's something for you to think about. Um, African-Americans are 2.5 times more likely to die from diabetes than white residents. Think about that number. Here's another number for you to think about. African-Americans are two times more likely to die from kidney disease, okay? Think about this. African-Americans are 35% more likely to die from stroke. That's a real number. And I want you to think about this. African-Americans are 30% more likely to die from heart disease. That's not a single digit percentage, that's a double digit percentage. As we talk about this conversation, equity, diversity, inclusion, and health, I wanna ask all of the panelists, and we have been through a lot lately, but I want you to kind of hone in and, and think about your response time too, but what are the continued barriers to health that you're seeing uh, people have in our community? And if you could, in your response, provide some examples. And then they all want to talk at the same time, audience. You and notice I, that, right? <laughs> and I'll start because, again, from the, the lens and the capacity that I am, we are preparing students to graduate and be healthcare providers. And so what we are doing is that we not only have to keep up with uh, medicine and, and practices, but we also have to make sure that we are equipping students to care for the demographics in which they will see. And so as our demographics continue to change, then our curriculum has to stay updated to that. So um, I feel like that that is uh, one of the barriers that we see is that we want to continue to diversify our student body and not only of color, gender, but we also want to do gender and socioeconomic so that we don't just look to say that you have increased the number of minorities, but also you have increased those who are from rural areas. 
So uh, that would be what we are trying to do is make sure that our curriculum is not stagnant, that it's current, and it is reflective of those numbers that you just shared with us, Nicole. And, uh, and we do have a question coming in from the audience. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, would other panelists like to uh, contribute at this time to the original question? Okay, I, I will. Well, I actually reached out to our community health center uh, CEO, Ms. Angel Moore. And I know that you all know that we have three community health centers uh, within our community and they're doing an excellent job. So um, all the facilities are listed on our website. And so I asked Angel this question. I said, you know, what are the most common barriers to health that we're seeing our people in the community face? And uh, she said that it was related to social de determinants of health. Uh, providers consistently at the medical center express the medical occurrences, diseases only represent one third of what our patients are dealing with. She said there are several barriers that we see challenges and a few of them consist of economic barriers, for instance. Uh, many of our community patients are 100 to 200 percent below the federal poverty level. And this creates a grave strain when it comes to affording medical care, uh, particularly surrounding co-pays, transportation, and pres uh, prescription uh, medication. And I know that uh, Ladarius probably can um, agree with that. Uh, she said, for example, we may have a single parent that has three children or dependents, and that only makes minimal wage income, and they're forced to choose, make a choice between daycare costs versus uh, medical co-pays or co-pay or paying for transportation versus paying for a prescription medic med uh, medication. And so she said in this scenario, they're forced to choose what is a priority. And that's, it's a shame that we have to you know, make a choice there. So unfortunately, this just works in a vicious, never ending cycle for us. Um, and she gave me another example of uh, a barrier to care of transportation. And we all know that there can be some transportation issues. And uh, an example that she gave is that we have so many patients that miss our appointments, or stop coming for appointments because of lack of transportation. And many times they can't afford their own vehicles and they struggle to ride the public transportation for the lack of access points and even changes to the public transportation schedule sometimes. We've had a single parents come to try and make an appointment with three to five children. Riding a bus, there's three separate stops, not to mention the notion that they have had to get off one bus, maybe walk a mile to get to another one in the rain or uh, cold and a uh, hundred degree weather. And she said, she's seen this scenario happen over and over and over again. Um, so what are we doing at Erlanger to help with this? We have a, we, we uh, offer a 340B discount drug program. You know that um, on Dotson, there's a CVS pharmacy there. So uh, patients that qualify uh, prescription medication can either be free or 90 to 95% discount cost. And uh, offer transportation vouchers, uh, bus passes for patients. If you need them, uh, we have uh, vans and cars that we can call that will assist um, the people who have Medicare, that are on Medicare and Medicaid. And we also have the case managers. So make sure you reach out to those case managers at the community health centers so that they can help you. And uh, last but not least is, I wanna bring home that we have limited English proficient patients that are visiting our facilities all the time. So we have interpreters available. And we also have uh, virtual interpreters. We have uh, limited, uh, limited English uh, IOWs, which is, in, which is interpreters on wheels. We have the iPads, we have the language phones to assist patients that are, um, with literacy problems, language, interpret need in, uh, language interpretation, food assistance programs. We have a list of uh, organizations we can uh, that help assist you. And we also have a counseling program. So make sure you reach out to us if you need us. And uh, we're on the website at erlanger.org. And also, you can also call the 778-2165 number if you need some assistance. 
Wow, thank you so much for, for that detailed uh, response, Elizabeth. And now I'm, I'm going to shift it to Ladarius and allow him to uh, respond to the question as well when, it, when we're talking about what are the continued uh, barriers to uh, health that you're seeing in our community? So for the sake of time, uh, I wanna say this. When we think about the barriers that are there, of course there are, as Ms. Applin said, there are many social determinants of health. One of the biggest that we don't often talk about in our communities is this right here. We think about the decisions that are made and how we serve underserved populations and communities. There have to be, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, there have to be faces and people that are at the table that are making these decisions to help craft how we're gonna serve these communities. So if you don't have people, one, that are there that look like and have a relationship with the individuals that you are attempting to serve, is no way that you're gonna reach them. One thing that we shy away from, and I'm on, I'm on this panel, so I'm gonna talk about it. If a community does not trust you, you're not able to serve them. You cannot speak into and influence what you do not have a relationship with. One reason why we've been very successful at Simple is because they allow individuals like myself to go out and continue to build relationships with people that look like me to find out what the barriers are for them. Like Angel uh, told Mrs. Appley, you know, I, a lot of our people, they have to make a decision what they're gonna do. They have to prioritize. And a lot of times it's sad to say their health is a last priority to them. It's not important to them. And it becomes a vicious cycle uh, for many of, of us in our community where if grandmama didn't deem it a, a, a important priority because she had to work two and three jobs and then mama came along and she was in the same mindset, well now those two individuals are now influencing and teaching this daughter or this son the same thing. You know, for me and my household growing up in a great two parent household, I understood the importance of primary care going to the doctor, routine checkups, going to the dentist. I was raised in that. So now with my five kids, I do the same thing. They understand the importance of it. But think about how many communities we serve where that is not a priority. So to me, that's the biggest, when we think about barriers, make sure we put people at the table that understand how these decisions, and, and let, me, let me say this, it's a priority to them. Because a lot of people that are making these decisions, it's not a priority them, to them to serve the underserved communities of black and brown people, all right? So that's where I'm at. I'm gonna stop right here so you can keep on going because I can keep going all day long on that topic. Well, can I say, I believe you just answered uh, the question in the chat, Ladarius, from uh, uh, Taryn Anderson, who said, who should be at the table to help craft a health equity plan for our community? And you literally, just answered that and we really appreciate that because that's so important and uh, all of us could have to continue to advocate for that with our leaders of all of our organizations on why you have to have uh, the representatives of the community at the table. Uh, it takes away the guessing game and a whole lot of other things. Uh, so at this time, since we did answer that particular question, and thank you so much for submitting that question, reminding the audience uh, that you are uh, participating in our session, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Health. Thank you so much for joining us. And also want to say that you, if you would like to ask a question, you can do that by chat. If you would like to join us by video, we'd love to see you. Uh, you can join by video as well. Uh, I do want to shift gears here uh, and, and switch from a more scholar conversation for Dr. Harris. One of the most successful methods for outreach and recruitment of, of new students. You talked a little bit earlier, but if you could elaborate on like some, some uh, active measures and, and, and things that we can share in the community of what Chattanooga State is doing. Yes, so uh, as I said earlier, is that we are the community college here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so we um, are often called upon to come and give um, tours and visits at various high schools, but we also are very, uh, have great partners and relationships with HCDE, Hamilton County uh, Department of Education, and their students come on our campus. We have a very robust recruitment department. We have a very robust um, student services. We have our interim uh, dean, Dr. Amanda Bennett, who is all about student services and her team, if there is ever an ask or a need, 
to be out in the community, we want to be there. So again, I don't know if you caught it, but I said we are the community college. So Chattanooga State, we rec we represent and Ladarius and a good, and again, others can tell you, if you call and I can do it, I'm gonna make sure that we are there because word of mouth and presence is our best recruitment tool. So there are sometimes that once you get students on our campus and even family members and they see how beautiful our campus is and they see how friendly we are, they want to send their children here. So I think that the recruitment to sum it up is recruitment is that we are in the community, we welcome visitors, we welcome partnerships, and we are always identifying ways that we can uh, expose how great we are. So um, that's what we do. I do want to give you a, a shout out. Uh, and I don't You're know number one. Anymore. I want somebody else to say that because I didn't want to say that, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, and not because we're friends, but because it's true. You can't go in a meeting and have a conversation about health care and engaging students and having them do some real practice in the community. The first school of students that will be requested will be the students from Chattanooga State Nursing. And I would say if I had an amen corner, I would have an amen corner and you would hear everybody roar like amen on that because it's so true. Everybody wants the Chattanooga State Nursing students because of what you all, the, the foundation that you set and, and the community engagement. So I do applaud you on that. Um, and, and speaking of engagement, let me switch a little bit to Ladarius back again, because uh, you were just talking a little bit about, you know, being in the community and having representatives at the table. But I do want to ask you about what kind of outreach work uh, that you all are doing at SEMPA when, it thinks, when you think about uh, doing diversity in uh, neighborhoods and in your service area. And, and I have a, a second part question for you. Are you ready for it? Is that okay? Can I get a nod? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm ready for it. Yeah. Um, and what have you found uh, to be the most successful method? Because that's key. What have you found to be the most successful method for getting people access to adequate health care? So uh, one thing that I really want to highlight that we just recently done, and we're about to do another one with CHI Memorial, um, is when you talk about mobile health clinics. And we have a mobile unit at Simple where we go into communities um, and even in the rural community that's not very often talked about where those resources are, are just as needed as the inner city. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that Dr. Harris and myself, uh, as well as some of the other African-American members on the subcommittee for Get Vaccinated Chattanooga, we talked about next steps. We said, what can we do? Yes, we're in a pandemic. Yes, we know that it's affecting so many African-Americans because of underlying health issues of which you alluded to in the 2019 picture of health. Um, the reason why we lost a lot of people during this pandemic is because of a lot of the underlying issues. So when we take the mobile health unit out and go into these communities, we did one about a month ago in the West Side where we did health screenings. And once we did the health screenings and we identified what was going on with people, then we were able to give them appointments and plug them into primary care. And then you may say, well, what if they don't have health insurance? Well, one, we have a sliding fee scale um, as you know, we th think about the Dotson Health Center and some of the other ones, they have that same uh, sliding health scale. But at the same time, um, it's really just about identifying exactly what's going on with people and plugging them into care and giving them the necessary resources. And let me say this, it's not all about, you know, of course, I'm on here as a representative of SEMPA, but because of the relationships with, that I have with individuals like a Dr. Harris, I'm able to pick up the phone and say, hey, I need you to help me out with such and such. Dr. Harris don't answer the phone, then I'm going to text her later on and say, hey, I know you got my phone call. You need to call me back. And she'll call me back and she'll say, even if I'm out of town, I'm going to send my students there. And she's done this. She just did it a couple of weeks ago. We were at Brighton doing vaccines. She sent her students over and they were able to help us facilitate getting that work done. So it's, it's not about, it's, it's collaboration over competition. It's not about us competing with each other. You got Chat stayed on here, you got Erlang on here, you got CHI Memorial, you got Simple. It's about us collectively coming together and making sure that we put out the best product for our community. Because at the end of the day, yes, you know, we got grants and, and numbers and things that we're trying to satisfy. But at the same time, it's about letting people know that they're more than a number. 
And a lot of people in our community feel like they're just another number when they go and they see people as it relates to healthcare. Um, and so that's, you know, it's about us showing our community just how passionate we are and how much we love them and how we're able to come together. Um, and that's, and I hate to say this, you know, it's just like in the church, a lot of times, the only time families see each other is when you get together for a funeral and stuff like that. But in our community during this pandemic, I really seen Chattanooga come together on so many different fronts to make sure that our community got exactly what it needed. And that showed me that we can work together for the greater good of each other. So. You are absolutely right, Ladarius, when you say we can work together because we've seen it uh, with the particular partnership that CHI Memorial had with Get Vaccinated Chattanooga. Uh, we, have, we, we did that. And so let's continue to encourage others to join us on this train of moving forward and supporting our community. I do want to reference something that's placed in the chat at this time. And it has also a reference from James Baldwin. So get ready for this. Uh, the, the, the comment is, I think it is not about how a person looks like. I think it is mainly about showing empathy in our statements so we can break the fear of reach out for help. And here's the quote. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And that was a quote that they provided by James Baldwin. So I do want to thank uh, the participants for submitting that. And please, uh, participants watching, uh, please submit your, your, your questions to us. If you'd like to join us by video, you can do that too. And just want to say thanks again uh, as we are having this conversation about equity, diversity, inclusion, and health. It is so important that uh, we break those uh, stigmas about, uh, well, grandmama didn't do it, my daddy didn't do it. No, you are changing the trajectory of your family and your community. You don't know what impact you will have by someone younger than you or so a peer see that you are taking care of your health. And so I do wanna give a shout out for my own organization, CHI Memorial. We actually go to the community with our mobile coaches. What is that? So we have the uh, Breathe Easy CT lung screening where if you call us or go on our website, memorial.org and you're requesting the mobile coach, we will come to your community. It doesn't cost anything for the mobile coach to go to your community. We also have uh, the mammogram mobile coach. It doesn't cost anything. All you have to do is call and request it. So I just suggest that you go to our website and find out more information, but you, uh, the champion, you on this call, you in this as a participant here, you are the champions, you are the new leaders for healthcare as we're talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I guess I need to be quiet and ask the next question, right? So let yeah, me get started on that. Go ahead, Dr. Harris. I just, I just want to add one thing though, and it kind of piggybacks off what Ladarius said short, just a little while ago about collaboration versus competition. And when we see that formula change, we all win. And if, if we stop trying to compete, because what you said earlier is that um, we don't know who's looking at us in the community, but if it's all about the common goal of making this a healthier place, a healthier community for us, then we all need to try to, you know, figure out what we can do to do more collaboration. And then the last thing I wanna say before you go on to the next question is, it's about changing the culture, where you live, where you work. And so, being at Chattanooga State, I do see that we are looking to change our culture because we want to be more inclusive. We want to be sure that people feel like they belong here, but we also want to continue to be that um, forefront in the community to say, we are here preparing these students to be, uh, I guess, um, vibrant, vital community leaders in the community. So again, I just wanted to go back, hope people heard that. Competition versus collaboration. The formula needs to change. It needs to be collaboration so that we all win. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. I do, uh, excuse my passion, but uh, let's do a challenge out there though right now. The next time you as an individual, any of us, uh, next time you go to the doctor, next time you get a pre-screening for your healthcare, I dare you to post it and I dare you to tag about 10 people to ask them when they've had their doctor's appointment. I dare you to do that because we have to start one individual at a time. We use this all day. I know for a fact we do because Dr. Harris, she may or may not answer your call like Ladari said earlier. Uh, but I dare you to start leading and letting people know, you know, post on social media about 
where you are at the doctor, like don't tell your business, but say I'm at the doctor, I challenge you to schedule your appointment, I challenge you, you know, and let's get this thing rolling. Uh, speaking of rolling, we have a question in the chat from um, Melanie Lusk, and she's asked, can you speak to nutrient rich food access and health disparities? Great question, uh, Mary. And uh, Melanie, and I also want to uh, add to this question. It says, are there strategies you are aware of to explore food sovereignty? Anybody like to take that question? I was making sure. Go ahead, Dr. Harris. Go ahead. No, no and again, and I, I'm just speaking from the platform that where I'm asked to speak from. And so at Chattanooga State, we have a food bank for our students. And so in speaking for nutrient rich food access that I do know we have um, in, in our county, we have a uh, food bank, but specifically because we saw our students that they were having food poverty is that there's no questions asked, there's no limit to it. You can come and you can get as much food, groceries, non-perishable items as that you need. And what we do as a college here is that we do an annual food drive so that we can replenish that. So that's what I know, Melanie, what we do here at Chattanooga State. Yeah, I was just about to say there are, you know, once you do your research, there are some different groups that, that have the mobile food pantries where, you know, they show up, uh, especially in food deserts. And we do have a couple here in, in Chattanooga, unfortunately. Um, for our clients that we serve at Simple, uh, we have a, a market that, uh, you know, they can come in and they can get fresh fruits and vegetables and things of that nature that answers the call of, especially with what they're dealing with. You know, we also have a registered dietitian on staff that talks to them and educates them about, you know, these are some substitutes that you can have to put in place as opposed to you. Like me, I love baked potatoes. Well, you can eat sweet potatoes and just substitutes and things of that nature in creative ways, especially when we think about our kids, creative ways um, for them to eat healthy. Um, so there are some resources that, that are here um, in our city. Yes, and at Erlinger, we are also our vendor. Uh, Sodexo has our contract and they do collect food on a continuous basis. And we have... Uh, if you have a request and you need food, we can all you can always reach out to the diversity department and we will get you in contact with someone that can help you with food. And right now we're collecting canned goods and we're collecting all types of food. We do have a registered dietitian on staff and they will be glad to uh, come up with a plan for any individual that needs that. We also are a teaching hospital at Erlanger. And uh, we have uh, some of our residents and medical students that will be willing to work with you as, as one of their projects, which we are trying now to work on disparities programs. And I heard you say uh, earlier, Nicole, about the diabetes and the kidney disease and the heart disease. And a lot of that has, it comes into the realm of our eating, the way we eat uh, and uh, access food. So if you have any issues with that or any questions about it, our community health centers are willing to help. And so as our diversity department, we'll get you in contact with our Sodexo uh, representative and we'll be more than willing to give some education on those type things. Thank you for that response to all of you. Uh, I'm gonna ask Elizabeth our, our last question before we conclude uh, this particular session today. And I do want to say that uh, CHI Memorial is the first uh, market hospital uh, from Common Spirit Health to have the uh, students from the Morehouse School of Medicine uh, joining us. Uh, we're, on our, we're coming up on our fourth round of students, but it's a 10-year partnership, a hundred million dollar 10-year partnership. And so it has been uh, very uh, uh, rewarding to have the students working in our ER and our neurology. And we're looking forward to having them do a lot more as uh, the 10-year uh, partnership goes on. Uh, so Elizabeth, I, I said all that to give you time to get yourself together because I'm going to uh -oh. ask you the last question. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth, uh, what kind of initiatives are currently underway at our, our Langer that can help bridge the gap in levels of healthcare access? Well, you know, I talked about earlier that we have um, access, uh, our community health centers are doing a lot of work with transportation, the prescription, medicines and things like that. But I did talk to Angel a little bit more about that also. What would, what would be that biggest challenge? And we talked about, you know, with COVID-19, the pandemic, behavioral health. 
And uh, we've seen over 65 to 75% of our uh, people needing behavioral health counseling and therapy. So we do have a counselor, Sean Winton, is our mental health therapist at the community health centers. Um, and they've created a counseling slots and created additional capacities such as virtual counseling visits. Uh, these solutions have implemented, she said, uh, to address the behavioral health needs in, within the community. You know, you would like to have one-on-ones, but because of COVID, you can't have a lot of one-on-ones. So they've created a lot of slots um, that you can reach him between eight and four, Monday through Thursday, and Fridays, uh, eight, well, I'm sorry, Monday through Thursdays, eight to five, and eight to four on Fridays. Um, they're currently recruiting additional behavioral health professionals because there's a need for behavioral health right now. So that's uh, one of our biggest challenges before COVID and still one of our biggest challenges. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the time and being conscious of what our, our plans are for this discussion. I want to thank our, our panelists. I want to thank Ladarius Price from uh, Central Community Care. I want to thank Dr. Martina Harris from Chattanooga State Community College. I want to thank Elizabeth Applin uh, from the Erlanger Health System. You guys are phenomenal. We appreciate everything that you do in our community. And before I hand it over to Natalie, I want to end how we started. And that is talking about the 2019 picture of health for Hamilton County when, it, when you think about African Americans. 2.5 times more likely to die from diabetes than white residents. African-Americans, two times more likely to die from kidney disease. African-Americans, 35% more likely to die from stroke. African-Americans are 30% more likely to die from heart disease. If you are watching this session right now, what are you going to do tomorrow, today, when we're talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, and health? My name is Nicole Brown. I am the manager of community benefits and diversity here at CHI Memorial. It has been an honor to have this conversation with United Way, Women United and Emerging Leaders for your Lunch and Learn series. Uh, Natalie, I'll take it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, Thank you to all of our panelists, Dr. Martina, Ladarius, and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for um, sharing your wealth of knowledge. I have learned so much today, and I hope that all of our participants have as well. Thank you to our participants for attending today. Um, like I said, my name is Natalie Patrick. I am the Community Engagement Specialist here at United Way, um, and I will be reaching out to you all after this session to provide you with more information about our engagement groups, Women United, and our Emerging Leaders group, um, and how to get plugged in and involved if you're interested. Um, and we will also include the contact information of all of our speakers, so please stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, and again, we look forward to this conversation again. Thank you so much.